What is crack a lacking, fellow thermonuclear A Eppers? I am damned. What was what did I say? Oh, I'm damned raviolis joined by my <laughs> certified fantabulous co-host, Mr. Grand Poos. How's that for the YouTube caption? We are here to begin wrapping up our one goal or thing we're watching or hoping to see or just monitoring for every NBA team for from now until the end of the regular season. We already did every single Eastern Conference team. Go check out those two podcasts. We are on to the Western Conference now. This will be a two-part podcast. Spoiler alert. This is, what is it? Part one. We can count to two. Before we get started, just subscribe or follow us. I'm over just pimping the pot. Like, we're just never, it's it's a futile endeavor. Thanks for all the support we've been getting on Twitter. I really do appreciate all the shout-outs and kind comments. Uh, but Grant, the most important question before we get started, how the fuck are you doing today? That's yeah. that. I'm going to. How the fuck are you doing? Today? You're coming in with some real energy and I love it. Uh, I'm doing really well because I watched uh, before we started recording. I was jumping around on League Pass and I not only saw Brandon Clark play in an NBA basketball game today for the Memphis Grizzlies. I also saw one Mitchell Robinson to whom we've apologized in the past. So he's very much podcast adjacent. He was also playing NBA basketball games tonight. So that was fun. Was nice you know what little- I saw on League Pass tonight? What did you see? Andrew Wiggins making positively impactful fourth quarter plays. <laughs> Color me flabbergasted. Fake, fake news. No, yeah, this is no <laughs> uh, So we're going to go through this exercise and we'll start, you know, we'll go back and forth. We're going to try and limit ourselves to like five minutes per team. Uh, we are going to start with alphabet, not even looking at it. This is how I'm just on one tonight. I'm just so, I'm so done. I'm in that type of a mood. The Dallas Mavericks. How's that for the alphabet? You got it. You did it. Uh, what? What? So I'll give you my goal. Why not? Um, I bet it's similar to yours. That is in fact the goal of this podcast is for yeah. you to give me your goal. Well, I mean, so, so what, a goal of ours could be to have discussed who should go first before this podcast. We did not meet that goal. Uh, so I'm just going to jump. Uh, sustain the defense, right? So uh, offense, great. We've known that forever. If you have Luca, you can figure it out with like four scarecrows, like stationed at odd intervals around the floor. Um, Dallas has much more than that on offense. They have Kyrie Irving. They have enough decent shooters. That all works. They have a 108 defensive rating this year with Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington on the court together. That's not like a world beating number, but man, that's awesome for the Mavs, right? And that holds up big time if you can score like they can. They've been limiting their three point opponent three point attempts and rim attempts way better with those guys on the court than they have like when you look at their full season numbers. So the types of shots they're surrendering. That has improved dramatically. They're like 78th percentile in both of those, which is which is good in term like top, you know, top quartile basically in mm-hmm. limiting opponent rim attempts and opponent three point attempt frequency. They're like 49th in three point overall and 66th in uh, percentile at the rim on the season. So big steps forward. They're 17 and six since February 5th. They got the number three offense. I said their defense has been seventh best, and it's not all shooting luck. 36 percent opponent shooting from from deep that's like it's not quite mid pack but like it's not the type of thing where you're like oh well that's why their defense is good they're allowing like 28 percent on open corner threes it's not that so some of it feels real we've got like a more than a quarter of a season sample that is what i'm pulling these numbers from so hold on to that and like shit i mean they're gonna score in the postseason so if yeah. you can just defend at anything close to this level you're really like it's a team you gotta take seriously which i don't know how you feel about it but I was not going to take Dallas seriously as a postseason threat just because of the defense, um, the way it looked for most of this year. But now I think I'm going to, you know, if this holds up, I got to, we got to really reevaluate some things. Uh, I was going to take them seriously because I just, Luka Doncic has by and large been spectacular in the playoffs and the chemistry that him and Kyrie Irving has developed has far exceeded my, I wasn't one of the, oh, there's only one ball guys way back when, but their chemistry is just progressing forward. Uh, that is, mine's like sort of tangentially related to yours. And it's, oh, by the way, the fact that their offense has been still there. And then if you look at their four highest volume three-point shooters in the month of March, none of them are shooting better than 36%. And like one of them is PJ Washington who's shooting 27% from three in the month, which is actually worse. And he's already been on a cold streak. That is not, well, my goal could be for PJ Washington to hit more threes. That'd be nice. Mm -hmm. I think they need to find what is their core? What is their go-to unit? And I think they've started to figure that out. And it's very clear that the blueprint is going to be I mean, they start this way, but you know the gist of four players is going to be Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, P.J. Washington as your four, 
and then a rim running big for mm-hmm. the most part. And it, that will probably be Daniel Gafford. It could be Derek Lively. And then I'm kind of like, well, what is the fifth player archetype here? Is it let's go with Tim Hardaway Jr. there? Do we want to see Dante Exum in that spot? Um, does Derek Jones Jr., of course, is in the ring for that? A healthy Josh Green could be there. The thing I would like them to try, and I'm just saying I would like them to try, that's my goal, is what would it look like if you played P.J. Washington, Maxi Kleba, and then a rim running big? I was just going to ask you, like, because you said, well, one of the givens is a rim running big. Like, don't, don't, do you think that Kleba is going to be, you know, this skeleton key that they turn to, you know, whether it's down the stretch this year to kind of try some stuff out? But and they used to do it in the postseason. Like, he was the fix, right? If you needed somebody mobile that could block a shot and also theoretically space the floor. Like, so you're saying him with another, with a big. Just, I, I just want to see it. And to, to that end, we have not. We've been, well, I guess we've seen it. I have not seen it. They've played 10 possessions yeah. with PJ and Kleba on the floor, plus a big. So, like, neither one of those two are the five. Um, what I'd also be open to, though, because you mentioned Kleba as a skeleton key, is well, is there a lineup with him as the, the him and Washington as your front line that makes enough sense to say, yeah, we're fine with like Lively and Gafford being on the bench when it matters most or for large spots of time? Um, they are so far, they are plus 10.9 points per 100 possession when Luca and Kyrie play with PJ at the four. And so that's incorporating a whole different bunch of type big. So I mentioned the ultra big lineup I'd like to see just to, I ultimately don't know a lot would fall on PJ Washington, I think in the, mm-hmm. the three big lineup, let's call it. And I don't know if he necessarily has the juice to do that. And I'm already concerned enough where, well, if you can't use him in a ton of screening actions and then you playing Kleba and who doesn't need to be involved in those, but Kleba and a rim running big, does that exacerbate that at all? Again, I just want to see it. That's the goal. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to see them futz and fiddle with, though, is that if you're going to go with a, I don't want to call it a smaller unit, but let's say five out, the Kleba, Washington, Kyrie, Doncic, Exum lineup would be yeah. one I'd like to see a lot more of. I think I saw it like twice so far this season. They've only played a few dozen possessions together. The numbers on it are actually good, but I'm not going to get into them because they don't matter. But I think the the Mavericks do need to kind of find out still the extent of their lineup flexibility so that we get to a point where I think we can look at right now and say, okay, you know what, this lineup and maybe this lineup is a crutch, but can you kind of find like one or two more that can be these postseason crutches? Yeah, it, you know, it raises an interesting issue. This is the last thing I'll say. I know we got it. We're trying to be semi-brief here, but like, I think, Tell me, I, I assume you agree. Like Gafford and Lively are two of Dallas's what, like seven, eight most valuable players, you know. And and ideally in a playoff situation, I, I, it's so impossible to avoid talking about every team now in like context of the playoffs. But like, I'm just not going to fight it. Uh, in a playoff scenario, like you 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 can't play both of them together, and s- just because like they're so duplicative, they're you know you can't play. Nobody's going to play. It's not like the it's not Antonio and Dale Davis and Rick Smith. Do you want to see four bigs? Is that you where this is? <laughs> it. Like a little bit of an issue, and I, I think maybe that only underscores the importance of guys like Washington and guys like Kleba because one or the other of them is just I guess Derek Jones Jr. is just going to have to be the four because you don't get to use both of you know two really important guys. You can't use them both at the same time. So that's just some something that struck me as you were talking. Um, you want to lead the Denver Nuggets or you want to hear my my goal for them? Uh, we can let's you want to try and alternate and see if we can keep up with that and the alphabet. Good luck. Sure. Lots, go ahead. Lots of expectations. So uh, there's an element here of and I wrote about this of just keep doing what you're doing with the Denver Nuggets. Right. What I basically want to see and they are already doing basically all the stuff that I'm mentioning was let's get away from ever seeing Jamal Murray and Reggie Jackson play together. That mm-hmm. is something that they're doing. But let's also kind of futz and fiddle with the Aaron Gordon at the five looks. And they've started doing that. And one, Aaron Gordon has played a lot more five this year than he has last year. Depending on whether you considered him or Jeff Green the five in regular season units last year, that gets obfuscated a little bit. But they're up like a plus four or a plus 4.6. Uh, they're plus four net rating this season when he's the five. That number's actually dwindled down. It was a lot higher. Is it a plus 13? At one point, I think because they're trying to explore when you look at some of the different combinations and we've seen like, oh, Reggie Jackson and Christian Brown will be in those units sometimes. What I this is my guess, and I think we've seen it, but this is my ultimate guess is that what you need to do and the goal needs to be this. It's Aaron Gordon plus 
the three other starters that aren't Jokic, so KCP, Michael Porter Jr., and Jamal Murray, and then find your preferred fifth. Maybe that varies by matchup. Could it be Christian Brown? Could it be Peyton Watson? Those are the two leading candidates. And then you leave Jokic to uplift even Jokic plus bench heavier lineups than maybe you would you would want to. Because you know what? Frankly, he can do it. If you have Reggie Jackson on the floor instead of Jamal Murray for some of those reps, they can still replicate a lot of that dynamic and you ensure that there is another ball handler there. Because if you are playing Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, you know, you know, are they going to break? There'll be other guys. KCP might still be part of those minutes, my MPJ, but you're losing a lot of ball handling juice. Um, at least the off ball movement around him will be stout enough. And I think I'm at that point with Aaron Gordon at the five in large part, because you don't, it's not, it's not that we expect it. Look, Nicole Jokic, when it matters most is going to sit. If it's a real game that they didn't, you know, blow a team out or get blown out in, in the playoffs, he will play 38, to 42 minutes a game. And so mm -hmm. you're trying to fill 10, six to 10 minutes. If you can win or be ultra competitive to a net neutral in those units, that's why Aaron Gordon at the five is so critical. And I'm not saying you need to burn him out now by let's play Aaron Gordon at the five for 30 minutes a game so that we can see what all these different combinations right. mix and match. I ultimately think though, you, you called Kleba a skeleton key previously for the Mavericks. Those units are their own skeleton key because yes, your best player in theory is off the court, but if you can mm. survive, Right, a good amount of those minutes. If you can find the lineup, and I, I'm at the point where, and I think the Nuggets are here too. So I understand my goal is, I guess, to not deviate from it to lean into it further. It's you know what? It's Aaron Gordon at the five with every single starter but Jokic. Yeah, so that's we're we're very much uh, aligned on what the issue is to figure out all, and well, more so aligned on the fact that Denver doesn't really have any issues to figure out. So we got to like find something. Um, so mine was just figure out the non Jokic minutes. Right. And the answer to that has often been, which makes total sense. Well, Jamal Murray better fucking be on the floor. Like if you're not going to have Jokic out there, you have to have him. The, the Murray on Jokic off minutes are, they're like a minus 16. Like, it's just like, it's awful. The crazy thing to me is, so I was like, okay, but what if you put Aaron Gordon at the five? Cause that's like, that's the next logical thing. Murray on the court, Aaron Gordon at five lineups are minus 7.1. They're plus four with Gordon at the five just across the board. Yep. But that includes some Reggie Jackson stuff. That includes some other like little used lines. So I was like blown away that, oh man. But so I'll give you the fifth guy that should be out there with the players you mentioned. It has to be Peyton Watson because that lineup, this look, we're thin slicing it like nobody's business right now. These all these samples are too small to draw conclusions, but we're looking for issues with the Nuggets. So like you just got to humor us a little bit here. If you have Murray on the floor, with KCP, with MPJ, and Gordon at the five, and Watson is your fifth man, that is that lineup has a plus 20.3 net rating. So there it is. Like, you can get real specific about it. Like, is it Christian Brown? Okay, maybe. Is it like, do you mess with Reggie Jackson somewhere else there? I don't know. But if if what you're really trying to do is figure out the non-Jokic minutes, that is your lineup. Those five guys, like, that's it. Stagger, do whatever else you need to do. But the, in, the indications from the season so far are, like, we need to be messing with this lineup way more often. Uh, they've played 38 possessions so far this year. I don't know why. It's got to have something to do with like, well, if we're going to take Jokic off, I don't know. We don't like to go to the Gordon at the five minutes with Murray on. We like to let Murray try to carry the whole second unit, which like doesn't work. The numbers say it doesn't work. So I we we got to basically you your your goal raised the question that my goal is like, oh, I have it. I have this lineup. So. Yeah, I mean the Nuggets are stupid good. Like that, we don't. Need that's to great. That's them. incredible that we were in. I know figure out the non Jokic minutes is kind of obvious for the Nuggets, but the fact that we kind of ended up in the same spot with it and without bouncing these off each other uh, yeah. previously was good. And by the way, I understand it would be a heavier lift on Jokic if you're surrounding AG at the five with as many starters as possible. They've only played it's sub 200 possessions with Jokic and no other starters. They've won them. They've won them. I was going to say, he can, it's a heavy lift. He can do it. Fine. He can do it. Not a problem. Jokic's one rep max of carrying the lineup is like off the charts. He's, it's not an issue. All right. Uh, that makes it my turn. Okay. So perfect. We get, we get my gold ABC DFG, Golden State Warriors. <laughs> uh, this one is like, I, I'm so bad at, at this team because it's like, well, which, which of the first 5,000 suggestions of mine would you like? Uh, because I'm just too close to it. Where's um, that SpongeBob mean of the long paper? Yeah, <laughs> just the longest scroll of all time. There, if the Nuggets are the no notes team, 
the warriors are the all the notes copious dude. notes yeah. yeah so i went with spam as many jonathan kaminga as an integral piece of your offense whether that's as a ball handler or a screener with steph curry spam those actions like to within an inch of their life down the stretch of this season because no, Mark is going to get ejected every other day. Yeah. Right. Because Draymond's getting ejected in fourth quarters again, or first quarters. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Whoa. I was like, yeah, he yeah, he's usually doesn't wait that. Can I say, uh, I, I tuned into the, their game against Orlando uh, in the second quarter, and it was like, oh, no, Kimming is not playing. And he was, you know, his left knee soreness, whatever. It's like, oh, Draymond's not out there. I wonder, oh, is he sitting? It's like, Somehow he got ejected like four minutes into the game, did not enter into my like spectrum of possibilities, which is like, why wasn't that your first thought? Like, why wouldn't you have assumed he got thrown out? Uh, anyway, I just think so. Marcus Thompson wrote a, a good, you know, he's got his finger on the pulse of this team, like few other people do. And his take recently was just that, like, there's no number two here. It, you know, it used to be Clay Thompson. Andrew Wiggins did it for a few months and it helped him win a title. Uh, Kaminga looked like has looked like it at times this season, but like if you're going and if you're going to have any success and that that honestly, that shit may have sailed, like in terms of meaningful playoff success, Kaminga just has to be heavily involved. If only by like, I think he's wildly talented. I think he's going to be a great player, but it's almost by default because you're not going to rely on Clay Thompson as no. good as he's been off the bench. You're not going to rely on on 2022 Andrew Wiggins coming back. Brandon Pajemski is struggle. Like, I mean, we're talking about rookies now, right? Like there's, so it has to be Kaminga. And I want to give you a stat. Um, oh. So this, I, I forget, I, I apologize. I saw this in more than one place. So Steph Curry's true shooting percentage in clutch situations. Have you seen this one uh, this year is 69.3%. Phenomenal. The rest of the Warriors team, their true shooting percentage in the clutch is 47.6%. And that gap between Steph on the one side and the rest of the team's true shooting percentage in the clutch is the biggest in the league. So like to, to that point, somebody else has to be like a high usage guy and just it's coming is the only realistic choice. So maybe it goes bad. He's hasn't looked great lately, like, or has been inconsistent, but I don't know. You got to run Steph and Kaminga pick and rolls, let Kaminga play with, you know, lead the second unit and just take a bunch of shots. Like you just, you know, it's a, it's a low odds play, but you, you got no other options that that's gotta be what the rest of the season's about. Yeah. They're so b before you get into mine, there's in such a weird spot because I don't know, we could talk about, yeah, you need to maximize the Steph window. I don't even know how they do that anymore. Right. Because if the answer is not on the roster. I don't know who's the guy you say, will go get him via trade that then fit. Like you could come up with players who are unrealistic, mm -hmm. but it's just like, you still kind of need some of the other surrounding parts to hit and so i'd be with you there mine's a little bit simpler and i by the way i totally agree with the kaminga steph stuff like just i know they do it but like do it more i know maybe you don't want steph screening as much but you're limiting him to under 30 games in the month of march apparently then he can screen a little bit more and then have you could also i know you don't like to run set plays like kerr doesn't like to do that but have kaminga screen for steph more then so i would agree with those how about winning at home yeah they're just like you go, I was digging into the splits and they're just so fucking weird. They're ninth in points allowed per possession on the road, 23rd in points allowed per possession at home. It's not because of opponent shooting luck from three point range either. It's opponents are shooting lights out inside the arc, but for mid range, not even like at the, at the rim, they're not great, but it's nothing like 75% or anything crazy mm -hmm. like that. There are some players that have some really, really, really atrocious, road splits shout out clay thompson and andrew wiggins they've just shot so poorly on the road but then when you go dig into like some of the home splits well brandon pajemski and chris paul just don't hit jumpers at home normally apparently it's like those should kind of offset and so it's okay well let's win figure out a way to win at home or what's going on here and i i, I use it as i'm using it as a launching point to ask you this question at what point is this less about, wow, it's weird what's going on at home with the Warriors, and you could dig into who missed what games. Steph has played a shit ton of games. So you've had yeah. Steph for most of those home games. Right. That's the that's the key ingredient. Are we just at the point where it's, no, this team just isn't very good. And that's, that's why. Because even mediocre teams are supposed to be better than under 500 at home, basically. And yeah. my final thought there is the only thing that I could maybe attribute it to it does feel like Steve Kerr is just searching 
for stuff within his rotation still. And that's a problem. And so my other goal, which might be a more realistic goal, is can we tighten this up? And unless you just want to avoid the play-in altogether at this point, and that's not not the goal. Well, it's interesting. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? Or someone, it was maybe the mailbag where somebody said, like, what should the Warriors rotation be? And I I think I listed like 12 guys because and, and Steve Kerr has gone to, you know, it just depends on the week. It's like Moses Moody might be the guy that's playing like the sixth most minutes one night. Brandon Pajemski was not playing, then starting. Now Clay Thompson's starting again. Like Trey, Trace Jackson Davis overtook Kevon Looney. And now, oh, but now we need like Kevon Looney's defensive communication. Steve Kerr said he's the best talker. So Kevon Looney's playing again. It's just, it's all, it's all just, they have a, a bunch of players who are like good at a few things. And the reality is collectively, they're just, the team just isn't good enough. The conversation ender that I have with a lot of my Warriors fan friends, we like kind of like when we really are going to get real about it, it's just like, they just don't have it. You know, it's like yeah. that. It's like that simple. They don't have it. They're, they don't, they're not good enough. Steph is just, just diminished enough to where he can't cover up all of this. And the weird thing is like, I really like a lot of their personnel. Like, I think, I, I mean, Kaminga, you know, I love Kaminga. I think Trace Jackson Davis is going to like stick in the league, which is nuts for a late second rounder. And Pajemski, I think is going to stick around. He's flawed. Like you go down the list, all these guys, you know, Draymond say what you want. Like he's still a really good defensive player, a good passer. Like he helps win drive winning. Like Clay's shot it well. And then it's just like, you look up and they're like, Houston's going to catch him. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't, Without Shane Moon. <laughs> it doesn't add up. So, or, or maybe it does. And we're just not being honest about like, you know, these guys just uh, to a man just aren't quite good enough. And, and the record's going to, the record certainly suggests that. So yeah, that's, that's where we are. It's a tough team. Quickly, Is there a guy? Cause you say you need a number two. And so if you were trying to think of who might become available, is there a guy they can go out there and trade for? And then, because I can't even come up with a name of all the players that we might like, even if it's Donovan Mitchell, I just don't even think that's the answer here. My whole thing is then could you then also get this player and be much better off after you probably just had to burn through some of the players that right. you discussed who you believe can be a valuable part of your rotation moving forward. Here's, here's where they are now. They're at a, in a position where what remains of the second timeline in two timelines is like the only way forward for, and it's for the reason you're saying, like, I don't think there's a guy out there that they could realistically get that like meaningfully makes them. I've, I feel like I'm a broken record. I've been saying this like for a long time, like that guy just isn't there. And so the warriors, you know, becoming a real contender again, depends on one Steph managing to be a, you know, an all NBA level guy into his late thirties now, it, de- it really depends on Kaminga becoming like an all-star level player. It depends on Pajemski, Jackson, Moody becoming, you know, the best role-playing versions of themselves. And then like Wiggins finds it again. And, you know, that like that kind of thing. Like it's got to be internal. And so it that's why it's like... That or they kind of need to hope that they have a more of an iron stomach for this second apron stuff yeah. than like the Clippers. Mm-hmm. Or the uh, the Boston, if they want to look at trading, I'm not say they fall short this year, and as well, like we want to, we'll move Jalen Brown. Like it's right. just too. Which so there's no indication that that the Warriors do have like a desire. That's a great to, like, point too. Outspend yeah. uh, the indications for several years have been like to the contrary that we're not going to spend pool salary money. dump. Actually, hints at the contrary. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And then, yeah. So it's, it's a, it's kind of a weirdly for me, like a painfully fascinating team to think about because uh, it's, it's hard to see a way out of this. That isn't just like the guys that are here, get better and, or the guys that are here stay good for long enough for, for, for those two things. It's the two timelines for them to overlap. That's just, that's what it is. Uh, All right. You got the Rockets. Yes. So mine for them, and this is just like, they've been they're entering a harder portion of their schedule but i've been very impressed with what they did from the onset without changun i'm a little bit disappointed though even during this stretch at the lack of amen thompson at point guard reps Mm -hmm. and i think you ultimately need to get there and i know that he's made a lot of progress as kind of just an off-ball cutter dunker type guy that's great because that's a way to and now i think even he and maybe jalen green have benefited from not having changun on the court just in the sense that 
not that he occupies the same space, but the lanes are a little bit more open, even with Ahmed Thompson on the court, because you are going to play him higher up when he doesn't have the ball to start. I want to see, though, there are fewer than 15% of Ahmed Thompson's possessions this year have come without both Fred Van Fleet and Alperen Sengun on the court. And even during those minutes, most of them are tethered to Jalen Green. And like that's going to be the guy that runs the show. And I understand now they're competing for the play, and it's probably really hard to mix in more of this stuff. And we've seen, I won't make it clear, we've seen a little bit more of it. But he is still at, can you guess, Grant, how many, and I'm not saying this is the bread and butter, but just how many pick and rolls per 36 minutes Amen Thompson is averaging this season? Oh, just take is, a stab. Is it even one? Is it's it 2.4. 2. Okay. It's 2.4, <laughs> which is just, that's too low for me. I want to get yeah. more information about this rookie. And I think you can also get to lineups where now, because you're playing Jabari at the five more, and if you don't want to have another non-shooter on the court with him, you can like you can get to the where, yeah, there's spacing around Amen Thompson pick and rolls. I'm not saying spam them, make that the identity of your offense. I just, I want to see more of it because this dude is so much of a game changer on defense. And you can see the passing vision from him, but also what he's been able to do off the ball as well. It's like, if he can actually work as a playmaker, let's forget about the jump shot. If he can then work as an on-ball playmaker, what is the ceiling on right. him then? And it's, I wouldn't even dare to come up with one at this point. He He's so interesting because the the way you're suggesting they figure out how to use him is to put the ball in his hands more, which is one of the things you do to sort of mitigate a non-shooter's weaknesses. What the Rockets are doing instead is like, he's kind of playing more center than anything. Like yeah. he's, he's doing the other, there's only two ways to go. You make him either play way out of position for his size and you can get away with a non-shooter if he's technically your center and your other big is Jabari Smith who can, who can shoot it. Um, or you play him at the point. I, I think that's, I really, I agree. I think you got to kind of go one way or the other, but it does speak to Thompson's like, I'd like still like, like lump of clay potential because it's totally reasonable that like he becomes a weird, like hybrid wing big that can guard up and, 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 or run pick and roll as a point guard. Like, but no matter what, he's going to defend the shit out of whoever's on Like, yeah, he's, he's really interesting. Mine, uh, I feel like I need to address the Jalen Green in the room uh, because I wrote, uh, I did a piece for BR about uh, young players who might need a trade. I forget what the total headline was, but the idea was like guys that, you know, this, that are good and have potential, but like this might not be the place for you. And Jalen Green was one of the guys I highlighted. And this was sort of more towards the beginning of what has clearly been, or I shouldn't say clearly, what sure looks like a breakout. Uh, this yeah. last several weeks and really most of March, he's just, you know, 27.8 points, 5.8 boards, 3.4 uh, assists over 40% from deep getting to the line. Like, you know, looks like the guy that you would have taken where he was taken in the draft uh, a little bit. My goal for the Houston Rockets is to continue to keep an open mind about Jalen green, which is to say, you probably don't need to, you know, like a month ago, you might've been like, I think, you know, we got to extend Shangun. We're not, you know, Green's going to command a big deal. We might need to move him because we also have Thompson. And like, you know, there's there's financial reasons and just the offense only thing may not play here with Emi Odoka. Cut to now and it's like, oh my God, let's max, can we max him now? Like, can we, can we do this immediately? Like all this scoring punch really matters on a team that I think wants to be built around defense other than Shangun. Like, the, so... I think you need to kind of go down the middle on this and at least, you know, you still entertain offers like the bridges offer. I don't know how you felt about that one, but the idea of Brooklyn getting, what was it? Green and two firsts for, for bridges. I guess there'd be salary in there too. Mm. And you know, I don't know, man, that sounds pretty good to, to, for, for the rockets at, at certain points. I think maybe this is more of like a goal for me as much as the, as it is for the rockets, but like, don't get too swayed by a hot March, even though the rockets are winning, uh, all of the stuff that Green did the last couple of years and earlier this year still really happened. Uh, so don't get over the moon about his potential now, but also like maybe pump the brakes a little bit on he's not long for the Rockets. So just kind of, kind of, you know, play it cool here. I, yeah, I think if you were going to make it binary and you're saying they need to get rid of him, that's wrong. What I will point out, and I actually posted this in Discord, 
uh, anecdotally in my head, I want to go make sure that it wasn't just me imagining it. This is what he does every single year. I've seen that it, point too, where he had, he had an April in like 22. Where yeah, he was and out it, of his it's money. been like, it's usually it starts sooner actually, where it feels like after the all-star break or slightly before he goes off, you need to start year stronger. Now in his defense, he's just been a part of so many different ecosystems and flawed pecking orders. It feels like, so the semblance of consistency matters. I'm just at the point where it's still very much TBD. And I think the goal is right. Have an open mind with him. I just don't like his is going to be fat. Do you just give him a max extension this summer? I don't think, I don't, I don't think, think you can. I don't think you can. And if he wants it, you probably need to let him go into restricted free agency at that point. And see what type of a year he has next season and then just pay him uh, his fit on this team. I, there's the potential for it to really work, but that also kind of fits into the, oh man, Thompson discussion where it's okay. If, if you want Ahmed Thompson to do more on ball stuff, how does that impact Jalen green mm -hmm. then? And so like the way they're using Ahmed Thompson now is probably more conducive to Jalen green sticking around long-term. Uh, so I, I, it's going to be interesting how those pieces come together. I, I think it's, you're right. I'm not out on Jalen. I was actually, pr I'm probably higher on Jalen green than you are to be clear. Yeah. I was I pretty close to like, out for a while. I am though at the point where it's, I need to see this happen like in October, November, December, January, because it just, it's not. And I understand that there are viable excuses out there, but like, we still need to, that's, that's tough information to like, this is complicated information to be working with when he's extension eligible this summer. Well, and another complicating factor is I'm not saying this is the case, but like, you got to at least start looking at like, how come we can't get this Jalen green with Shingun? Like, you know, I'm not saying one or the others at fault or any, anything like that, but it's like, you have to think about how they're going to, what the synergy is going to be between theoretically your, well, not theoretically, like your two best offensive players. Like, why isn't it possible for both of them to cook like this? It, do you, you know? think it's like, because I think when he's had the ball during these stretches, Jalen Green looks more methodical and like yeah. there's a change of cadence there. But do you also think like, because when you want to maybe, I, I would have to look at how many possessions there or their average offensive possession time, but it's Shangun is going to maybe inherently slow things down and that's not the best. Yeah. fit for Jalen Green if he's not going to be on the ball as much. I'm I did not research that. I'm just spitballing no, there. But I'm just no, it, it it's it's something you got to think about now, right? Like it's just because if Green is going to do this, then suddenly it's not just like, well, we got Shangun, so who who cares what this other guy can do? It's like, well, wouldn't it be nice to have both of them play like they can play like, you know, and they're both young, they're both theoretically they should fit and yeah, so the, the Rockets got a lot to think about. Um, it's a good, it's definitely a file file this under good problems. I would say though, too, ultimately for the time um, being anyway, at this, right, at this yeah, exact right. moment. Right. All right. Uh, so uh, the Los Angeles Clippers are yours to start. They are mine. With. I have the Clippers. Uh, their goal should be to get some stops softies. According to Toronto well, who, spoiler alert. I don't even just because then it'll streamline. I have defensive consistency for them. Okay. I have stuff to back it up, but it's, we are on the exact it, same. Page I mean, it's kind of, I guess you could say like make some make some threes because they are they, stinking in three points oh, per game. I actually have I have that pulled up too. Do you? They've been outscored since the All Star break by 120 points from beyond the arc. They're 24th in made threes per game since the break. They're 19th overall on the year. But that is not that was my backup issue in case we we matched up on the first one. So I didn't prepare a third one. Sorry, I, I didn't think we would have a hive mind. But yeah, the defense is 18th overall, 28th since the All-Star break. Like that's kind of baffling, right? Like it's just with so the, some of the personnel they have, you assume if you have Kawhi out there, I know Paul George has been banged up too, but like that's like, that's hard to fathom. Um, oh, the other, sorry, but I did have a little bit more on the three-point shooting thing. Like Harden got one three-point attempt up on Monday and in over 30 minutes of action. That's the first time that's happened since 2012 that he only got one one up in over 30 was that minutes. was it 2012 with the thunder or the rockets like how far back it would have to be the thunder like there's well he was 2012 13 he was with houston so it could have been might have been 11 12 though either way that's why so his shoulder apparently is uh an issue um so i just wonder Do you think like, he's trained it when he tried to block <laughs> yeah probably he did something else the other day too that was weird what did he like oh who are they playing this is a bad podcasting because I'm just trying to think of the other. Well, I would like to say on the, while you're trying to figure that out, I want to know, I wish we could give Kawhi truth serum 
and find out what he thought about James Harden trying to instill positive vibes by fucking with Kawhi's shooting splits. Like, I honestly don't have an issue with what James Harden was doing, but for that to be the player he tried, like, it's I, weird. Yeah, it's weird though. Um, I can't remember. He like kind of wrestled with someone or something. Oh, I think he was like messing with Tyrese Maxey. It was like put him in a little like fake headlock or something during against the Sixers. That's what it was. So Harden's acting up. Some so the weirdness is he wants uh, to go back to Philly. Yeah, right. Get him. Get him. He wants to go. Uh, yeah, Steve Ballmer's a liar. Uh, let's get him back. Uh, so, like, I don't know what the the issue is. I I sort of wonder if like I don't know. You're you're built around a couple of like aging guys that are that are not looking to get up and down the floor, and maybe this is just age. That like transit their transition defense has been really bad, and that kind of maybe ties to this. These guys are just kind of worn down defensively. Um, but yeah, twenty eighth on defense since the all-star break and 18th overall that's you know rough it's hard to remember when these guys were 25 and 5 over that 30 game stretch uh with defense like that so that that's got to be the focus from now on yeah and i would highlight specifically their transition defense which has been butt all year is like especially ass right now uh, <laughs> Luke, sit- butt ass. it's getting more yeah. <laughs> so on the year they are 28th i believe in points allowed per 100 possessions in transition uh that is not that's not great folks and i think i like you you watch them and like you sense it and it's like well in the half court and by the way they're still top 10 in half court defense but like the ball containment it feels like has regressed what coming off screens when they didn't have westbrook it did feel like they missed his rebounding and physicality um i don't know Is it the personnel that puts them in a transition pickle? I still don't think even when you want to look at, well, this team could stand to be a little bit more athletic. They shouldn't be this flammable in transition or even on the glass. Like this is the the casualness with which they can approach rebounding or getting back on the break when you watch them is just inexcusable. And like, because you're not going to make up an athleticism deficit there by getting back late. Like there's, if you go watch a bunch of these sets, it's like three to four players on the Clippers are just out of frame while the other team's getting in to their offense. And they've been especially burned because of that, where it's, I would call them, they're either transition threes or semi transition threes. They give up a lot of early shot clock triples. Mm. And this is just like, if teams are taking early shot clock triples, it's not because you coaxed them into it. It's because it's probably a higher percentage look. And I don't know if they have the perfect mix of personnel to address it, but it's like, I, I find when I watch them, it's there's too many instances of I don't want to be the try harder guy. I'm the get the fuck back guy. Like this well, is like you don't need to wait and see where this misses. If you're not going to hit the glass hard, get back. And the fact that they don't do either exceptionally well in a lot of their lineups is problematic to say the least. So it's interesting. I, I don't think you have to be the try harder, uh, or you know, uh, even even to Ron Lu calling him soft is kind of like it's pretty coach speaky. But this term I I heard recently, I I love it. It's it's describes exactly what you're talking about. It's when you don't go hard to the offensive glass and you also don't hustle back in transition. Coaches call it a stay, as in like you just stayed where you were and like looked at the ball and and didn't pick one or the other. And it's like, we got to stop having so many stays. I think it was Steve Kerr that was talking about stays. Uh, So yeah, that they have, I would love to know if, if we could get like the uh, tracking data, how many stays do the Clippers have where, cause you can just picture James Harden, you know, 34 feet from the basket, not running to the offensive boards and not turning around to hustle back. Like that's just, that they've got to be high up in the league and stays. So you have a real coaching term that you don't have to rely on. Uh, try harder, hustle, run, run back. Stop fucking staying. Is apparently, <laughs> no, the... we need more goes. Doesn't matter which direction. We need direction. more, goes. We need more goes. goes. No more stays. They are. I should have looked this up. They got to be like in the bottom five of defensive rebounding too since the All Star break. Like they, uh, they got to well, be overall. They're 18th in offensive rebounding and 23rd in. Uh, opponent offensive rebound. So 23rd in defensive rebounding. Not that's since the overall. all-star break or overall? No, that's overall. I guarantee you they're worse since the all-star break. Yeah, I'm looking at, I'll look at just March because it's just easier to filter very quickly. And they are, oh, all right. They're, they're, uh, they're a rock solid 16th. Congratulations to the, to the Clippers. Transition defense is still kind of ass though. Good job. Fellas. So we've gone from butt to flat out ass to just kind of ass. <laughs> I don't know what the next step is. We should probably move on. We're going to move on to the Lakers here. They are they are my team. So 
this comes with the caveat. I'm I'm talking more about sustaining something rather than like adding something. And it's this: can they maintain what's happening on offense? They are Grant fourth in point scored per possession on the offensive end. A couple things are not going to continue. I'll tell you what's not going to continue. <laughs> they as a team will not shoot forty one and a half percent on threes. Even they they're still like bottom five in frequency. That's a whole other issue, but that I'll get into in a second. They're also shooting collectively. 77.2% at the rim. I'm going to tell you this. That's not going to continue either. You're not going to shoot about 80% at the rim. Now, what I am noticing though, and this is, mind you, this is all happening with like a different type of emphasis on the officiating where it's like, oh, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be as efficient necessarily, I would say, at the rim, this team specifically. Austin Reeves has been, I'm going to steal your term again, the skeleton key, I think, to unlocking a lot of what they're doing on offense, not just because of what he does as a cutter and a screener, but he is finally getting his offensive volume up there. So prior to February 1st, he was taking about 5.4 threes per 36 minutes. Since February 1st, he's up that to 6.1. And since March 1st specifically, that is now like at basically seven attempts per 36 minutes. He's shooting the hell out of it. But for a team that doesn't get up a ton of threes outside of D'Angelo Russell, and if you want to throw LeBron James in there, I do think his willingness to let her rip, even if they're not going in 45% of the time or whatever their number is going to be, it opens up the floor in the half court that allows you to get these higher quality looks at the rim that we've seen from them. Or if he's more of a threat when he's running and spraying out in transition, fanning out in transition, excuse me, that's going to open up their offense, those opportunities even more. That's something that they need to figure out a way to maintain and it's not, I don't, I'm reticent to say, just tell him to keep chucking threes, but it's, they've seemed to have found a better balance among their, I'll call it the core four with AD, LeBron, Reeves, D'Lo, the spacing, the usage, how things are working for them. And yes, there is some fluky shooting involved overall, but they've been able to open up pathways to the basket, not just for LeBron, by the way, but for Anthony Davis more. And I think that this version of D'Lo is absolutely critical, but it kind of feels like he's fallen by the wayside is Austin Reeves. So I think it has gotten better this season. And there definitely was a, a, a level of inflated. Oh, he plays for the Lakers. This guy's going to be amazing. He's still on one of the better value contracts in the league. And I never kind of understood the whole, well, why would teams want him if they were going to trade so-and-so to the, like the DeJounte Murray talk where it's like, well, they're not going to want Austin Reeves to pair. And it's like, why not? One of the best yeah. value contracts in the league. It's short really term. Long, doesn't matter. So that's something I'm going to be monitoring from them moving forward because this team is not going to take enough threes. Like to, for either of us to just, enjoy. if they do, we're talking about, I mean, like Rui Hachimura shot the three ball. Well, it's just not in high volume. That's not their game. That's fine. You need to make the most out of your volume, but if there's a player who can stand to continue boosting his volume, I think it's Austin Reeves. Okay. I like that. Uh, I, I've thankfully, I did not pair it. Your you exact did, we would have, we would have just had to end the podcast. I know. Because that's like, we already don't disagree enough, like for in podcast terms, but uh, so you know how we talk all the time, and by we, I mean just the NBA discourse about, you know, the Lakers, their real conundrum is like, well, you know, just pretend everyone's healthy. It's like, ah, we got to get Jared Vanderbilt on the floor because he matters for defense, but like nobody guards him. So, ah, okay, fine. Well, D'Angelo Russell is really important to the offense, but he falls apart defensively and gets attacked in, in the playoffs. And like on on down, Cam Reddish, which I don't know which way Cam Reddish is helpful, but like they seem to think he's helpful one or the other. So all these one-way guys and all, you know what makes that not matter? When Anthony Davis is like a top five player in the league and see the title they won uh, when he was that. So my goal is for them to bottle the current version of Anthony Davis, who's real, real close to that, to the bubble guy that was the best player on a team that won a championship. So just, so his last four games, 28, 15, and six. 23, 19, 4, and 4, 36 and 16. This last one is the ridiculous double overtime, but still 34, 23, and 4 blocks. He's played in 96 of the last 100 of possible games for the Lakers. So, like, the numbers are there. You can go advanced too. This is Anthony Davis we're talking about, by the way. His <laughs> defensive rebound rate today, this year, has never been higher. This is one of the best rebounding bigs we've just ever seen. Like he's he's this is the best he's ever been on the defensive board. It's technically tied with 2016-17 when he was 23 years old, but that's still pretty good. 
uh, all, like a bunch of his advanced metrics. He's in value over replacement player. This is the best he's been since 1920 when, when he was incredible. Uh, if the Lakers have this version of Anthony Davis, like just, I don't know, you, you've got, the, you're not going to fall out of the play in now. Cause they've, they've been good lately. Just whatever you like bubble wrap him, like put him in carbonite, like do anything you can so that this guy shows up to the playoffs. Because if you have this guy, nobody gives a shit about D'Angelo Russell's a one-way player. Nobody cares that like, oh, is Austin Reeves good enough? I don't know. Like we think so. Nobody cares. Like none of that stuff matters anymore because you have just like the, I mean, short of Jokic, you're going to have the best like game wrecking two-way center in the league. And who's also, by the way, I can't remember if you met, I don't think he did in the start of March. He's shooting like 39% from three on almost two attempts a game. That's there's, like there's, there's bubble Anthony Davis. There he is. We found him. So yeah, just like there. And there are certain teams that Anthony Davis on defense is just like an unsolvable problem because mm -hmm. he just shuts the rim off and you can't exploit him on switches either. So if you get this guy, like, you know, it's such a hot take thing to be like, the Lakers are dangerous. If you have this version of Anthony Davis, not saying it's guaranteed to happen. That's why their goal should be to like figure out how to keep him playing this way. And you're a threat to just, just about anybody. Um, and you might even be the guy who could give Jokic the best run, right? Like if that's, that's the way through the West, like, I don't know who you think is going to hold up against Jokic better than Davis. Like, that's just, I mean, he's the, he's, he's, he's the guy. So keep this version of Anthony Davis should be the goal. I don't care how you do it. Very quickly. Who are the like players? What are the trustworthy players they have for their playoff rotation? Cause you mentioned Cam Reddish and they're like, they've gotten away from Cam Reddish lately. And so you have, you have LeBron, Rui, D'Lo. I don't even know that I trust Rui, but he's played well enough to like, it's Rui. It's Rui, oh, it's LeBron, Rui. AD, D'Lo, Austin Reeves. Reed. I guess Prince and Dinwiddie, like those have been their seven most used players of late. Is there even another guy like beyond, oh, we're going to sprinkle in Jackson Hayes because we need reserve big yeah. minutes. I think I'm not even, I don't trust all seven of those guys, but like, that's just the, yeah. It's that's the game, just it, right? If Vincent ever plays, like, oh, maybe he's that. coming back. Darvin I mean, will come up with excuses anyway, but that's a great point. Yeah, Gabe Vincent. That imagine he just comes back, looks great. Talk about like a late season addition that could swing oh, things if Gabe Vincent is is the Gabe Vincent from like two years ago or something. If oh, if you got that Gabe Vincent, he's immediately like it's it's LeBron, AD, Reeves, and then like Gabe Vincent is is like your next most important guy. If you get you know Miami Heat playoff runs, Gabe Vincent for sure. We are on to our final team of this podcast, the Memphis Grizzlies. Who are, are they, they're my Memphis Grizzlies? I think they're mine. No, I think they're mine because I did AD second for Lakers. Yes. Yeah, we almost made it through without screwing it up. You know uh, what? I kind of forgot that we, because I was about to say, yeah, you just did the Clippers. And I was, we just had a discussion about the Lakers. <laughs> I'm just writing it off. Uh, well, this, I mean, I don't know if this is a good one to end on. This is a really hard one for me. Um, I, I guess, you know, this team has just been beset by injuries all year. And like, there have been some good things that have come out of it. Guys like Gigi Jackson and Vince Williams Jr. are like, oh, we got some rotation guys all of a sudden. That's fun. And they're young. And that, you know, maybe that's what we build our, you know, five, six, seven, eight spots around some of the, some combination of them and the guys will get back. Anyway, I think you got to figure out where specifically Jackson is kind of the most interesting to me, like where he's going to fit rotation wise who he might make sense with so like you get clark back and you know he has in the past played like a fair amount of backup five against certain matchups or i you know he's just been the center mm -hmm. can you figure out like does jackson make sense with him uh does jackson make sense with uh jaron jackson does he make sense with like both of them do wh where does zaire williams you're not going to find this out because williams probably isn't going to play uh, the rest of the year, but like, where does he fit into the mix? So there's and Santi Aldama, I think is, is, you know, in March, he's shot 38% from deep 46% from the field. Jackson has been cool in March, like 42% from the field, 33 from deep, but just like that guy's a find. I think he's, yeah, I don't know. I don't think he's just going to be empty numbers. Maybe again, this is kind of the, like, how much do we trust what's happening on a go nowhere team late in the year? So grains of salt all around, just figure out like, which of those guys make sense next to the others? And then you can make your just your other decisions about the rest of the roster going forward. Like you have Zaire Williams extension eligible. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you're going to pay him, but there was a time where you were like, this guy's going to be our fifth starter. Um, so just kind of sorting out where the kind of emerging players and the returning players 
need to fit in the next, you know, I guess really it's about next year because who who cares about the last few games here? I literally have written down terrible podcasting again, provide a glimpse into 24, 25, which well, is so hard to do say about the Grizzlies. It has to be about next year. And so it, Clark coming back, it's are him and Jaron Jackson, your front court, or as you mentioned, Santi Aldama has done pretty good as a passer this year. Is that the answer? And then you had mentioned Gigi Jackson. That is something like, can he be, because he's played so much for, can you play him and Jaron Jackson Jr. together in the front court? Do you know how much time they have spent as the front line, the four and the five with Desmond Bain on the floor? Oh God. Uh, I, possessions. You want a possession count or minutes? Possession count. I bet it's under a hundred possessions. It is under five possessions. It's four. <laughs> okay. Maybe check that one out, fellas. Let's see how so, that looks. You need to get that information and Desmond not having John Morant, Marcus Smart being banged up to high heavens. That makes it all difficult. But now you have enough players where you're looking at, like the fact that Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr. are there. Okay, we can get information about how some of these guys will look like it. Like Desmond Bain's role is not going to change dramatically next mm -hmm. season. They're going to need him to run less of the offense. But like when Marcus Smart was so bad at running, the offense this year, like Desert Bay's still going to need to be like the number two guy when it comes to running the offense. Oh yeah. Darren Jackson Jr. is there. So you need to find out that information. And then it's even kind of like, if you want to play, if you find out, okay, well, like we can't play Gigi Jackson at the four. Can you get by with him at the three? Or does this team's search for a wing need to continue? Because Marcus Smart's not the answer quite frankly. Like that's what they found out. And again, it's so hard because we didn't see there should be four best players basically available together at all this year but you need to find out as much information now as possible. And I think Brandon Clark coming back is big to see, well, what can him and Jackson do together with Bain? And I think it's working out from there is okay. You have your two core players in Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr. Available. Let's kind of shoehorn in different combos. And I think it's most valuable at the four specifically, but again, the three as well, because that's still a kind of a huge question mark for them moving forward too. I mean, you might even get a look at like almost the entire potential second unit for next year. Cause if you leave Bain out there with backups, you might play him with Williams, Jackson and Clark and a and somebody else. Like you could really get like how, I don't know how valuable that is because you're going to go as far as your, your best five man lineup can take you. And like so many of those guys are out, but I think it, I think there is value to be had. Probably if, 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 if that's all you do for the rest of the year is like, okay, I don't know, maybe this is what we're going to look like uh, in the beginning of the second and fourth quarters, you know, in 2025. Like, that's not, that's not nothing. That's, you may as well try to glean some information because you're not, you know, you don't get any sense of like the team's ceiling if your best players are hurt, but th there's something there. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to take us out of here? Do we do under an hour to get through a, a podcast here? Just seven teams though. That's a banner well, moment for us. But still, you, you can feel free to take us out of here. So that we, we keep it under an hour still. No, no, no. I'm going to do a nine minute outro just so we get over an hour for some reason. Uh, everybody, thanks uh, for listening. Thanks for watching. Like Dan said at the top, please uh, rate, review, subscribe, uh, sp spread the news, spread the good news of our podcast to your friends and your enemies. Isn't spreading the good news like a religious thing? Whatever. Do, just tell everybody it, it's a religious Easter's experience. Easter's coming period. up as we record this. So maybe it's the. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Help us resurrect this podcast by oh. Sunday. <laughs> oh, that's so mean because of how yeah, poorly well, we've been performing. I just, right, look, Easter, you want uh, to peek behind the curtain. That's part of the reason I'm done. This podcast, I think, is operating at its peak of quality yes. editing personality. It has never been less popular than it is right now. I can't. Well, that's because I haven't finished the outro. It's going to be so good from here on out that every, your the subscriptions are going to skyrocket. I'm just That's going to start posting say. thumbnails like Uber drivers sucked me off to our podcast and see if that'll make people click. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, join our Discord. Uh, the link to figure that to, to do that is in the YouTube and podcast description, as is the route to some of our merch. Dan is supporting it. He's always such a good. Uh, Good supporter of the podcast. I have some and magnets. Like, who's even say hardwood knocks on it? Come on, Grant. Like <laughs> unbelievable. Uh that's it. Shout out, Frank <laughs> Nilakina. Apologies, Jared Allen. And Mitchell Robinson, he's back. <laughs>